Good afternoon and welcome to the Anatomy Reverse Session First Quarter 2021 Update. My name is Christy McKee and I work on the business development team at ClearBridge Investments. I'm proud to be hosting today's call with our investment strategists, Jeff Schultze and Josh Jamner. Our format today will be to take you through some prepared comments and then answer questions from our audience. I know some of you submitted some questions when you registered. However, you can also continue to submit questions throughout the presentation via the chat feature. We'll try to get through as many of the questions as possible, and we'll have our client representatives get back to any that we're unable to address on this call. Before I hand it over to Jeff and Josh, I just want to note that ClearVish is an active manager solely focused on fundamental equity, offering concentrated but balanced equity solutions with ESG integration across our investment platform. As at the end of the year, we manage $177 billion in assets in man under management. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jeff and Josh. Great. Thanks, Christy, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the update here uh, for the anatomy of recession in the first quarter. And uh, obviously, uh, the first quarter is proving to be very interesting uh, with all the market action that we've seen, especially with uh, the game stops of the world. But it's also interesting from an economic perspective. And you, you've certainly seen the economy slow over the course of December into January. Um, retail sales, for example, which has been the poster child of the V-shaped recovery, has seen three consecutive negative months of, uh, of uh, prints here recently. Um, you're seeing some economic weakness in the labor markets. Uh, and the jobless claims number, for example, popped up to 965,000 just a couple of weeks ago uh, from the low 700 range. Uh, this morning, we got a very positive print. It is dropping down to 847,000. However, if you look at that number in relation to pre-COVID levels, 847,000 would be a weekly record for jobless claims, surpassing 1982's record of 695,000. So you're seeing some pretty pronounced labor weakness because of COVID-19 and the economic restrictions that are being put in place. It's also being seen in the jobs report. And the December jobs report came in well below consensus expectations at a negative 140,000 print. And it has a lot of people wondering whether or not this is just a slowdown or a double dip recession. And because of that, we decided to re-release the recession risk dashboard, which is a group of 12 variables that have historically done an excellent job of foreshadowing an upcoming recession. It's a stoplight analogy. The goal is to go from a green expansion to a yellow caution, ultimately to a red recession. And as of the end of December, we still have seven green, three yellow, and two red signals. But more importantly, if you look at the bottom of that first column, we are still very clearly splashing and expansion colors. So we think that this is indeed just a slowdown and not something more sinister like a recession. Now, if you look on the left-hand side of the chart there, uh, the dashboard does look through the three economic fault lines of the economy. At the very top, we look at consumer health, the biggest part of the dashboard because it's the biggest part of the U.S. economy. Right below that, we look at business activity because businesses, of course, are responsible for hiring and doing CapEx both of which have a multiplier effect on U.S. economic output. And then finally, we look at financial stresses because financial stresses tend to emanate first before the economy rolls over. And not surprising, if you look at that financial stresses uh, fault line, all three of those indicators are still flashing a green expansion. Um, gold, not surprising to us because the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index is the most accommodative in and on, on record. So there's a lot of liquidity sloshing around the U.S. financial system. But the other one that I want to point out to you on why this is a slowdown and not a double-dip recession is the second one under business activity, ISM Manufacturing PMI New Orders. Now, if you're not familiar with Manufacturing PMI, all it is is a survey given to manufacturers asking them how business conditions are, but also how they look to be in the future. The most forward-looking component of that is new orders. And Manufacturing PMI New Orders mirrors the business cycle. When it accelerates with a three to six month lag, the U.S. economy accelerates. When it decelerates with a three to six month lag, the economy tends to weaken. And 50 is the level, that's neither expansion or contraction. And December's print came in at a very, very healthy 67.9, which is very bullish for capital spending trends. It tells us that this indeed is just a slowdown. There is a lot of strength underneath the surface for the U.S. economy. The other thing I'll really mention quickly here on the jobs report for December is that although the headline number was very weak, um, I actually view this as a very strong print showing the resilience of the U.S. economy. 
Because if you take a look beneath the surface, there's approximately 500,000 job losses in hospitality and leisure. And that's exactly what you would expect with uh, cases moving higher, economic retrenchment, social distancing. Um, so obviously the epicenter of COVID-19, which is hospitality and leisure, is going to see a disproportionate amount of job losses. But as you move to the middle part of the year and you get to herd immunity, a lot of these job losses are temporary. They'll likely assimilate back into the workforce fairly quickly. But if you strip out hospitality and leisure, December's jobs report was positive 350,000 jobs. It's a very strong number. That's double the pace that you saw in the post-GFC era. And, it, and I think that is really the true barometer or, or the true picture, if you will, of the health of the U.S. economy. And the U.S. economy is very strong if you strip out that epicenter or the hospitality and leisure sector that's being affected right now. But it, obviously, it leads me to a, a natural question. And if you had joined the, the update in October, uh, you would remember that we gave our non-consensus bullish outlook for risk markets, uh, fully expecting a rotation into, you know, the value and the cyclical areas of the market based on a catalyst, which is either the blue wave or vaccination hopes. Um, obviously, Pfizer's very positive vaccine results was really what caused that violent rotation. And it, it has become kind of clear to us that our optimism is being increasingly shared by others. And our view for 2021 is, is pretty highly consensus. Now, the one thing I'll mention is that being in line with consensus, although it's irritating, it doesn't really mean that we're likely to be wrong. In fact, I'd actually argue that consensus is right most of the time, but it's often wrong at turning points. And identifying those pivotal moments is where investors can really make outsized gains relative to peers. But kind of given that backdrop, I really just see limited scope for a meaningful anti-consensus surprise over the coming quarters, given all the policy support that we've seen, not only from the Fed, but from Congress, but also the expectation of a renormalized economy as we move through this year. And, and I make the argument that equities are facing one of the best backdrops for continued gains that we've seen in quite some time. A lot of the risks that we had coming into 2020 and through 2020 have faded to the backdrop. Global trade wars are no longer really an issue. The pandemic, we continue to see a decrease of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths here in the U.S., and also the U.S. election. And with this bullish backdrop, our core view is that the equity markets are going to continue to melt up throughout the first six to eight months of this year. So sometime in the third quarter, there, at that point, you're likely going to see the markets become fixated on potential changes in Fed policy. So although our outlook has become more or less consensus over the last three months, since we did our last update, um, the key here is that we're much more optimistic on where the U.S. economy can generally operate for 2021 and 2022. So we're ahead of consensus expectations for that. A key reason why we're ahead of consensus expectations is because of the consumer. Consumers have built up their balance sheets over the last year. And in fact, compared to pre-COVID levels, they've accumulated total excess savings of $1.4 trillion. Now, this does not include the stimulus that went out from the December package. This doesn't include the likely stimulus that's coming out of the package currently being proposed by the Democrats. And if you include those two packages, total excess savings is going to swell to over $2 trillion. And by the middle part of the year, when we reach herd immunity, I think that we're going to see some deferred gratification or revenge spending that's really going to supercharge U.S. economic activity. And it's important to recognize that the reason why you have this excess savings is not because of caution on the part of households. This is what happened after the global financial crisis. People were scared to spend. They're scared of losing their jobs. They're delevering. The reason why you're seeing this excess savings is because of government transfer payments, but also the impact of mobility restrictions. People aren't able to spend. And when you take away that hurdle, which is going to be herd immunity, again, I think it's going to unleash a lot of capital into the U.S. economy and really goose growth in the back half of the year. The other thing I'll mention is the, uh, the, um, the uh, release, uh, the U.S.'s reaction uh, to administering shots uh, for the vaccine. Um, we really stumbled out of the gates here. Um, we were hopefully to get one million per day um, at the end of December. We have now reached one million per day here over the last week, and I do see a clear path over the course of February of reaching two million shots per day. So our expectation for herd immunity is probably sometime early in the third quarter. 
but you're going to see an acceleration of economic activity well before that because as you inoculate frontline workers and high-risk individuals, you're going to see a decline of hospitalizations and deaths, and it's going to catalyst, be a catalyst for the economy to start to grind higher at the end of the first quarter. But consumer balance sheets is one of the key reasons why we have above consensus expectations for growth in the coming years. The other part of the equation is corporate balance sheets. Corporate, corporations have done a great job of cutting costs. Uh, they've also issued equities. They've taken advantage of low-cost financing. And because of all of these measures, they've accumulated a half a trillion dollars more in cash today versus pre-crisis. And that's going to be used to fund growth initiatives. It's going to be used for CapEx, inventory restocking, dividends, share buybacks. And one of the underappreciated drivers of growth in the first half of the year, in my opinion, is a massive inventory restocking cycle because inventories in the U.S are currently at levels last seen in 2014. And we expect this restocking cycle to really energize the manufacturing sector for the first couple quarters of this year, because businesses finally have the visibility into the back half of the year, and they're gonna anticipate this large pickup of demand. And restocking pressure right now is so great that we expect it to push industrial production and capacity utilization back towards pre-pandemic levels somewhere in the July range or the middle part of this year. And, and once that happens, it's going to jumpstart a much more robust CapEx cycle. It's going to allow investment to broaden out beyond just technology CapEx, which is what you've seen more towards the industrial CapEx that you see at the beginning of an economic cycle. And on the right-hand side there, if you look at the NFIB, inventory satisfaction level, um, you haven't seen these levels in close to 45 years. Um, so inventory restocking is going to be a key driver of growth uh, in the first couple of quarters of this year. And the other driver of growth is what I call the macro trifecta, key ingredients that have proven to power strong economic recoveries. The macro trifecta is lower long rates, a weaker dollar, and lower energy costs. Historically, these have acted as tax cuts to both businesses and consumers. But what's unique about this cycle versus other recessionary recoveries is that both long rates and energy costs have remained much more depressed compared to what you typically see. And that's going to provide a nice macro tailwind, not only for 2021, but also into 2022 as well. Um, if you think about long rates, when they, they rise, it usually has a lagged effect on economic activity anywhere from 12 to 18 months. So given how low long rates are, that means that's going to be stimulative not only for 2021, but likely for the first half of 2022. And then looking at the chart here, as I talked about earlier, manufacturing PMI is synonymous with the business cycle. Usually, 10-year treasury yields run very closely with manufacturing PMI, but you've seen a huge divergence at the end there where manufacturing PMI is clearly skyrocketed. It's above 60, and 10-year treasury yields, they've risen but not to the degree that they should have at this part of the cycle. So that macro trifecta is really one of the more underappreciated reasons why growth should surprise to the upside in the next couple of years. The last reason is stimulus. Uh, I, this is really the bow on the top of, of, of the U.S. economy and financial markets. I don't, I don't think we needed more stimulus, but we're getting stimulus, and it's really going to only add fuel to the fire and amplify the business cycle. And if you look at the fifth one down, the phase four COVID relief package passed in December. That was a huge package. It was 4.3% of GDP, $900 billion. But more importantly, out of that $900 billion, $700 billion was going to be released into the economy in the first two quarters of this year. So it was very front loaded. And to put that package into perspective, it's roughly double or roughly the same size as the main fiscal package that you saw in 1981 and in 2009. Um, so, again, those are the two worst recessions that we've seen in modern history, and it's roughly double the size of the fiscal packages that you see in other times of economic stress. Right below that, though, that's Biden's American Rescue Plan, the proposed $1.9 trillion. I don't think it's going to be as big as what's currently proposed, um, but even if we get something in the $1 trillion range between those two packages, that's 8 to 9% of GDP that's going into the economy when the economy, in my opinion, is in a really good position. So in putting all of this together, you know, expectations for growth over the next couple of years are pretty optimistic. This is consensus expectations. And uh, consensus expectations for 2021 is expected to be the best in 20 years. Um, but it's not just a one-year phenomena off of easy comps because of a recession. 
If you look at consensus expectations for 2022, it's the best growth that we've seen since 2004. But again, given all these dynamics that we talked about, I'm expecting instead of growth for 2021 being at 4%, which is consensus, I think it's going to be closer to 6%. Uh, so I think it's going to come in way above consensus expectations. And I think the key here is that policymakers uh, and market participants, they have yet to fully appreciate the magnitude of the accumulated savings that we've seen because these numbers are just so large. Uh, they're out of historical context. And quite frankly, they're really difficult to comprehend. And it really doesn't take a vivid imagination to see how this could supercharge an already vaccine-induced hot economy. I mean, think about the consumer having $2 trillion worth of excess savings. I would make the argument that the U.S. consumer is in the best shape they've ever been really since 1945, coming out of World War II with forced savings and, and rationing that went on during that time frame. And in my opinion, there's a lot of forecasters and policymakers that are out there that are extrapolating way too much from past cycles. And the one that they're extrapolating way too much from was the global financial crisis, right? Take the Fed, for example. The Fed is clearly fighting the last war, which is the GFC. Even with this rosy backdrop that we talked about, they have their foot all the way down on the accelerator. If you look on the right-hand side of the chart there, that chart shows you real 10-year yields, that purple line. That's an effective barometer of how easy or tight monetary policy is. When the tenure, real 10-year tenure yield is more negative, that means policy is getting easier. When it moves higher, uh, real yields move up. That means policy is getting uh, more tight. And uh, since the crisis, policy has continued to get more and more easy, even though the U.S. economy had a 33% positive GDP growth number in Q3, and they had a 4% positive GDP print number that came out this morning for Q4. But the Fed is doing a lot of things very aggressively to get us through this crisis. First off, they're doing QE at a pace that's extremely aggressive. They're buying $120 billion worth of bonds per month until they see substantial further progress in employment and inflation. $120 billion per month is one and a half times more than any other QE program that was ever instituted by the Fed. So that's a massive amount of bond buying. But they're also moving to an average inflation targeting regime. Um, they, if you look on the left-hand side, the reason why they're moving to this average inflation targeting regime is to make up for past misses and hitting that 2% target. And it makes sense because since 2008, they've only hit that 2% target three times. So in order to start raising rates, Powell's indicated that he wants to see the unemployment rate at pre-COVID levels, which is 3.6%. And he wants to see sustainable 2% inflation. And the key word there is in sustainable. And based on the Fed's dot plots, which is basically their expectations for growth and inflation and un the unemployment rate, at the end of 2023, which is as far out as those projections go, they see the unemployment rate at 3.7%. So that's really close to where they want to get to. But more importantly, they only see in inflation at 2.0%. And that's not sustainable. So at least from the Fed's perspective, they don't expect to raise rates until 2024 at the earliest. And this is a really important development. It's a, it's a, a sea change to what's happened previously because the Fed has had their fingerprints on almost every recession except for maybe COVID-19's recession. Usually the Fed sees inflation. They get concerned about it. They raise rates. They raise rates too much. They break something in the economy and cause a recession. And then they cut rates and start the cycle all over. And the Fed has finally recognized that it's actually more detrimental to the economy to raise rates early rather than raise rates later once they see inflation. So this new framework is going to allow them to become accommodative much deeper into an expansion. And it means that this expansion isn't going to be hampered by monetary policy anytime soon. And it really creates the conditions for economic heating down the road. But the key here, even though I think that this is a welcome change to the new framework, is that they're looking at this recovery like this is the global financial crisis, but the backdrop between the two recoveries couldn't be any different. The first difference is the origin of the recession. This recession that we recently had was an exogenous shock as opposed to an inherent economic problem. If you put that differently, the economy was fine up until the lockdown occurs, where with the global financial crisis, we had a lot of issues 
that needed to be dealt with in the aftermath of the crisis. You had an overheated housing market. You had an overlevered consumer. You had bank leverage concerns, which means this recovery is going to be much quicker, economically speaking, because there aren't those pre-existing conditions. Where during the, the, the GFC post-era, it, that those pre-existing conditions really created a drag for about three or four years. The second change is that you had a policy response today that was much more effective in limiting structural damage to the economy. Policy tankers came out fast. They came out hard, swiftly. They got money into businesses and consumers' hands very quickly. And it resulted in not much scarring, economically speaking. During the GFC, it took them a long time to calibrate that right policy prescription, and that scarring was very evident in the economy. The other feature is that households are in much better shape today compared to the last crisis. Today, we have housing prices that are moving higher. Financial markets are ripping. You have supportive uh, fiscal stimulus. You have a decline in spending. And because of all of these different features, household net worth has increased by $5.2 trillion today versus the end of 2019. If you look at credit card balances, they've fallen by $100 billion since the onset of the recession. Right? Consumers really don't have the major roadblocks in ramping up spending. Again, in stark contrast to the GSC, where consumers are nervous, they had to delever, again, all creating a very different environment. But maybe the biggest difference between the two recoveries is the labor market. Now, if you look at the chart here, you can see that the NFIB small business hiring plans, uh, which if you're not familiar with the NFIB survey, it's the premier small business survey. It took until 2014 for hiring plans to get to where they were pre-crisis. Today, we're already there. If you look to the right, it's the same thing with job openings. It took until 2014 for job openings to get to where levels were prior to the recession. Today, we're already there. And job openings is really important because if you have a lot of job openings that are out there, that means that there's ample opportunities for people to find jobs quickly. It creates a situation where you have much faster trend growth. And about 77% of the job losses that we've had were concentrated in areas that are COVID sensitive. So when you get to the middle part of the year, you get to herd immunity, I think you're going to see a much stronger rebound in labor market activity. But labor markets is another key difference between the recoveries. The other difference is business confidence. Again, on the left-hand side, it took until 2014 for small businesses to be as optimistic as they were before the, uh, the crisis. Uh, today, even though you have seen this number drop here, we're very close to where we were pre, uh, with the pre-recessionary levels. And small businesses are the cohort that should be not optimistic because a lot of their business models, quite frankly, rely on face-to-face -face interactions. They're at the epicenter of the pandemic, but yet small businesses are fairly optimistic even in this type of environment. And again, if businesses are optimistic, that has a, a very strong possibility of growth initiatives being funded, CapEx, hiring, again, all important key ingredients for a strong, quick recovery. Business confidence is also evident uh, through another measure on the right-hand side, which is through business formation applications. Not surprisingly, during the GFC, it plummeted. It really didn't recover until 2011. Today, business formation applications have skyrocketed. Now, part of this is fraud from, you know, the Paycheck Protection Program and trying to get distributions. But nonetheless, 25% increase of business formation applications is an anomaly. Uh, and it's a very good sign that you're having creative destruction, you have animal spirits, and it's a very good sign for economic growth over the next couple of years. But maybe the last difference between the two cycles is from a demographic perspective. And one of the more underappreciated reasons why you had slow growth during the last expansion is from a demographic headwind created by baby boomers. And this headwind was coming in two distinct areas. On the right-hand side, you can see that there was a huge step up in baby boomers exiting the workforce, an increase of retirees that the U.S. had never experienced before. And when people retire, they spend less, right? So that's a, a pretty big drag on economic activity. But in the middle there, you can see that there was a large uh, number of boomers that were exiting their prime spending and earnings years, which happened to be ages 35 through 54. And unfortunately, they were being replaced by a much smaller Gen X, which means fewer individuals were in those prime spending and earnings years. Again, another headwind to growth. But looking forward to today, you have the exact opposite situation. Instead of a demographic headwind, you have a demographic dividend. And it's actually quite similar to what we saw in 1994. Now, the light green bars are 2019's demographic profile of the U.S. 
The dark green bars is 1994. And in the middle of the chart there, you can see that millennials are now entering into their peak economic and earnings years. And this is going to be a tailwind not only for the rest of this decade, but it's going to go through to the middle part of the 2030s. But the demographic dividend isn't going to be as strong as what you saw in the mid-1990s. So if you look to the right there, you had a lot of baby boomers today that are retiring that just weren't evident what we saw 25 years ago. So maybe to take a step back here and just kind of summarize our point, my points here, the Fed is clearly fighting the last battle. The Fed is going to be accommodative much deeper into this cycle because they finally recognize that raising rates too early is more detrimental than raising rates later and, and actually seeing inflation. So they're not going to pull the punch bowl away from the party. But this backdrop could not be any different than what we experienced 12 years ago. Right? The two recoveries are different because, A, you didn't have uh, pre-existing issues with the economy as you went into COVID. You had a lot of issues to work out in the post-GFC era. Secondly, you had the right policy prescriptions. So you have limited economic scarring this time around. Third, consumers, in my opinion, are in the best position that they've been in really since 1945. They are in a position to really spend and be a tailwind to the economy. Labor markets are in a much better position. You have robust business confidence right now. And then lastly, demographics are going to be a tailwind to economic growth rather than a headwind. So given all of these dynamics, I think that you're going to see the U.S. economy grow faster than consensus expectations over the next couple of years. But if you have better economic growth in the U.S., that's going to go a long way of creating a situation where earnings are going to come in better than what consensus is expecting right now. And if you look at the last three earnings quarters, which is Q2, Q3, and then so far here, Q4, all three of those quarters, uh, earnings have beat both on the top and the bottom line by almost record levels. And I think that's going to be something that continues as we move into the next year. But obviously, people are concerned with valuations. Right? U.S. valuations are not as stretched or as stretched as they've been really since the dot-com bubble. Right? So there's a lot of people concerned about having that exposure to U.S. equities. Um, so I, I, my, I'm going to turn it over to Josh Jamner right now to talk a little bit about our views on valuations and why the valuations that we ascribe today to equities may not be the same valuations that you would have just described to equities in, say, 1980 or 1950. So, Josh, uh, maybe turn it over to you to talk a little bit about uh, the valuations and, and how we're thinking about that. Thank you, Jeff. Um, as Jeff said, you know, one of the biggest debates in the market right now is, is are equities overvalued or not? I feel like for the last six months, that's probably been about 50% of what I've, what I've talked to people about. Stocks end of the year at uh, 22 and a half time next year's earnings. And that's actually down slightly today. We're roughly 22 flat. Uh, there's been some earnings revision higher over the last couple of days as earnings season's really started to get going and stocks are more or less you know, flat, maybe up, maybe up a little bit year to date after this morning's move. But there's a couple of reasons why these higher valuations today could be supported, as Jeff was alluding to, particularly when you compare them to historical lev levels. The first of these is the makeup of the market itself. When you look at the S&P 500, the amount of the benchmark debts and cyclicals, that is stocks such as financials, industrials, and energy, they're near their lowest share of the benchmark in history. If you look at the slide in front of you, it goes back to the mid-1920s or just under 100 years. Cyclical stocks tend to trade at a discount to the market as a whole, given that they usually have much greater earnings variability or higher level of uncertainty. The flip side of this is that non-cyclicals or defensives and growth stocks tend to be more stable and often trade at a premium as a result. These stocks are often found in areas like tech, consumer staples, or utilities, to name a few. Right now, they're at just about their greatest share of the benchmark on record. So if we're looking at the market today, it has less weight to the types of stocks that typically trade at a discount, and has more weight to the type of stocks that typically trade at a premium. The result of that is that it's going to push up our baseline estimate of fair value for the market as a whole relative to history. A second factor influencing valuations right now relative to history is interest rates. If you go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, we all spend so much time focusing on P-E ratios, but if you flip that around and look at E divided by P instead, you get what's called the earnings yield, which is a measure of how much you're paying for a dollar of earnings. This is more comparable to the fixed income universe, where it's pretty typical to look at yields. It's how most things get valued. And if you take this earnings yield and look at it relative to a treasury yield, you get what's known as the equity risk premium, or how much extra yield you get for taking the risk of investing in a stock instead of a treasury bond. With the move lower in Treasury yields last year, it pushed the ERP up, and right now it's sitting around 240 basis points, which is pretty wide relative to history. 
This tells us that stocks are rather attractive relative to bonds, and that has several impacts on equity valuations. The first, and I think most important of them personally, is that given the relatively lackluster return profile of a bond from here, you tend to see investors shift some of their allocations toward equities in order to meet their required return. So what happens is you push equity valuations up because you've got more money moving into stocks, that is the P in, in PE, and you have almost no change in their underlying earnings, that is the E. So you end up with a higher PE when interest rates fall, given this dynamic. The third and final reason why multiples are higher right now in our view is what I think of as kind of a typical post-recessionary behavior for the stock market. If you look at past recessions in the early part of the rally, that is the first nine months or so off the lows, you tend to see a large increase in multiples driving stocks higher as investors begin to discount the possibility of a rebound in earnings. Then over the next one, two, even three years, you tend to see earnings come back as the economy you know, gains steam and, and moves out of its recession. Typically, PEs come down during this period, but earnings are so strong that stocks continue to move higher, generally speaking. So if we look at where we are today through this lens, we're about 10 months since the lows in late March. It was roughly nine months at year end, right at that point where you would kind of have this handoff between valuations driven stock returns and earnings driven stock returns. So far this year, as I mentioned at the beginning, we've had actually a slight contraction in PEs, but what we really want to focus on is as we move through the, the full year 2021 and into 2022 even, we'd expect earnings to power this next phase of the rally. Consensus expectations are for 24% earnings growth. It's been rising in the last couple of days as earnings season's getting kicked off and companies have been updating their guidance figures. Uh, it was down around 22%, maybe two, three weeks ago, just for reference. But with str such st strong earnings growth, it means that we should expect modest multiple contraction unless stocks have a monster year and grow even more than earnings do this year. So pulling all this together on valuations on the next slide, if you start with the historical average of 16 times PE, for the last 25 years, we can work to kind of understand the year-end multiple of 22 and a half or the 22 flat today by looking at these three things. The first is that sector mixed impact, the weight of cyclicals versus non-cyclicals. That's one turn to multiples relative to history. So our 16 kind of fair value or average should move up to 17 just from that alone. The impact from low interest rates I talked about is another two turns. So it takes us from 17 up to 19 in our view. And then that post-recessionary dynamic where earnings come back over the next two, three years following the recession, that's currently pushing PEs up by one and a half turns. So we can take so from that 16 flat starting point, we can kind of take these three factors and say, oh, fair value in the market might be something like 20 and a half times next year's earnings. You add it all up. That doesn't get us to where we were at the end of the year, which we're still about two turns short, right? We, I said we, we ended the year at 22 and a half. And I think there's a couple of things. We didn't want to put too many uh, you know, columns on the chart here, so we grouped them together in other. Uh, some of this could be things like lower tax rates relative to history and better free cash flow conversion. Uh, if you look at companies today, for every dollar of earnings they have, they're generating a couple cents more in free cash flow. And if cash flow is ultimately what we as investors care most about, that should work out to be a higher PE relative to history as well, all else equal. Of course, there could be some uh, you know, good old-fashioned overvaluation built in here, too. People chasing the market, you certainly saw that, uh, arguably, over the last couple of days in the GameStop type of names. But when you look out more broadly at, at the index as a whole, it's relatively minor. Um, you know, bigger picture, I think that multiples today are largely justified when you look at their underlying fundamentals, as well as broader economic and financial conditions. To be clear, we think multiples could drift lower over the course of this year as that post-recession earnings renormalization plays out. And perhaps if we see continued leadership rotation in favor of cyclicals or interest rates come up at all, uh, that could also push down our sort of assessment of fair value. But again, when we go back to the question of is the market overvalued at current levels or not, our research suggests that actually PEs are pretty logical at their current levels when you account for, for, for all of these different things. Great. Thanks, Josh. And uh, obviously, we've presented quite an optimistic outlook uh, for both the markets and the economy. Um, our core view is that the markets will continue to melt up over the first six to eight months of this year. Sometime in the third quarter, the markets will probably be fixated on the Fed's response function. Um, once it becomes clear that we have reached escape velocity and we're clearly on our way to very high economic growth. Um, but history would suggest that maybe the market will have a difficult time moving forward over the next nine months. So I'd like to give you both sides of the coin and, and and, and share with you things that we think about at ClearBridge and, and trying to come up with our macroeconomic outlook. So if you look at the two periods that were most similar to where we stand today, 
the most aggressive moves off of major market lows. It was the move following 1991 and 82's recession and the move following the global financial crisis in 2009. You can see that in all three of these instances, the first nine months, the markets were up anywhere from 65 to 75%. And at that point, you ran into resistance where the market had to digest those moves for approximately three quarters before re resuming its trend higher. Um, if you think if you think about 1982's session, that would mean that the market digestion is going to start in February of this year. If you look at the global financial crisis, that means that you're likely going to have a hiccup sometime in April. And again, quarter our view, we, we do believe that we're going to be going through some sort of market correction or consolidation here uh, over the next month or two. Um, that has been a core view of ours. We've been talking to our clients about that. Um, but we do think that that is going to be a buying opportunity because, again, given all of the dynamics that we talked about earlier, uh, the fact that there aren't many meaningful anti-consensus surprises that are out there, the fact that we feel economic growth is going to surprise to the upside, we feel that earnings are going to surprise to the upside, and earnings is really going to be the key driver, in my opinion. Um, I think the market will look at this shallow consolidation that we have and continue to grind higher until we get to, again, the third quarter of this year, where Fed policy is going to come much more into uh, the conversation for investors. But nonetheless, I feel like this is a, a very good graph to share with you um, that stocks could potentially catch their breath here over the course of 2021 before resuming their March higher. But again, that's not our core view at the moment. And the other thing I, I talked about being consensus is it, it irritating and having a 6% view on real GDP growth versus 4%, I would say is pretty meaningful anti-consensus. But the other area that we differentiate with consensus is where the 10-year treasury is going to ultimately end up at the end of 2021. Um, this is a distribution of sell side 10-year forecast for the end of this year. And out of 58 analysts, only four think that the 10-year treasury will be north of 1.5%. Uh, by the end of this year. I, I think that's a very complacent view. Um, I think it's probably going to be closer to 1.75% because, in my opinion, I think it's going to be very difficult for rates to remain depressed in an environment where nominal GDP growth is going to be close to 8% this year, close to 6% next year. Break-evens continue to grind higher, and it's more to realize that if you look back to yeah, the, the December 31st of 2019. So as we entered into last year, the 10-year Treasury was at 1.92%, right? So uh, I, I don't think, I don't understand why people don't think the 10-year Treasury can rise above 1.5%. But again, given all this growth, given all this stimulus, uh, given uh, the dry powder that's on both consumer and businesses balance sheets, um, I think there's a very strong possibility that the 10-year Treasury will rise throughout the course of this year. Now, the Fed could always tweak their QE purchases and start to buy 10-year Treasuries if they get concerned. But if the 10-year Treasury is rising because of stronger growth and in inflation expectations, I don't think the Fed will see the need to tweak their QE purchases and push down long yields at the moment. But the key is I don't think this is going to be a big headwind to equity valuations or equity returns. Um, I really think 2% is the level where if you get north of that, it's really going to compress PEs and have a detrimental effect to the market overall. So that's all of our prepared remarks. Uh, again, we're above consensus uh, with our expectations are for economic growth in 2021 and 2022. We do think that the market will surprise on the upside from an earnings perspective. We think the market will continue to melt higher for the first three quarters of this year and running into resistance sometime in the late third quarter. Um, but uh, again, if you do get an opportunity for a pullback here uh, sometime over the next couple of months because of stretch positioning or over optimism, uh, we very much think that that's a buying opportunity uh, to take advantage uh, of the rest of the move higher that we anticipate for 2021. Uh, so with that, maybe I'll turn it over to you, Christy, and see if we have any questions. Excellent. Thanks so much, Jeff and Josh, for your thoughtful comments. Um, We've had actually several questions come through from the audience. And so I think let's start with um, the first question about the new administration. Um, what could be the long-term impact of the new administration's goal from a trade, regulation, stimulus, and tax perspective? Okay, uh, lots to cover. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, from a trade perspective, uh, I don't see things getting uh, much better under a Biden administration versus a, a Trump administration. 
What I will say is Biden's going to be tough on China. Um, you know, we're not going back to the kind of free market, multilateral world that we had prior to the Trump administration. I, I really don't see Biden relaxing any existing tariffs. Um, I think he will resolve trade disputes, but he's certainly not going to join any of the multilateral trade agreements with China at this point. Um, I, I don't think he's going to relax on tech, Huawei, uh, scrutiny, on dual use. Uh, but the, the key difference, in my opinion, is I think his tone is going to be different. I think it's going to be more measured, more predictable, more process oriented. Um, but uh, I think in the near term, I, I, I don't see anything from a trader's perspective getting easier. And I think what the, the approach Biden may take is uh, to mend uh, relations with our historic allies and uh, take a united approach towards changing Chinese business practices. But that's obviously going to take some time. From a regulation standpoint, regulations didn't really reverse under the Trump administration, but they certainly didn't in advance. Um, but I do think that you are going to see more regulation, uh, especially in uh, energy and environmental areas. Um, you could also see potentially more regulation on the tech front. Um, but all in all, even though it may impact some areas of the marketplace, I think from a macroeconomic level, regulation the impact is going to be relatively modest. Uh, from a stimulus perspective, um, there's such a thin majority in the House and the Senate um, that I think there's going to be a very there's a lot of difficulty passing. Uh, large stimulus packages through budget reconciliation. So I do think there's probably going to be a two-bill strategy uh, approach, which is similar to what happened with President Obama in 2010. The first one being bipartisan, and the second one being by through the use of budget reconciliation. Um, the bipartisan approach will probably be lower than $1 trillion, uh, considering that we just did a $900 billion package in December. It's going to have a lot of Republican initiatives embedded in it, and then after that is passed, uh, I can see a budget reconciliation with just using the Democrats to pass a lot of their initiatives with state and local government funding, maybe some individual checks going out, uh, also some initiatives with infrastructure packages and, and, and the green initiatives that were outlined with Biden's agenda. But all in all, um, I think you probably get stimulus between the two packages somewhere in the call it 1.75 to $2 trillion range which from a short-term perspective is going to be great for the markets and great for the economy, uh, but it does need to be paid for, and that's going to be higher taxes. And the area that you're going to see the highest taxes uh, and generate the most money, uh, in my opinion, is, is corporations. Um, I could see the corporate tax going back up to 25 or 26 percent uh, from 21 currently. I also think you're probably going to see tax gains increases to maybe 28 percent. Uh, and you're also probably going to see that top tax rate go back up to where it was prior to the Trump tax cuts at 39.6%. But the key here, Christy, is that it's going to be effective 2022, not 2021, given the weakness that we're seeing right now with the with the labor markets. But given uh, the fact that the economy will have so much momentum as we go into the next year, I, I really just don't see that being much of a headwind, more of a speed bump for the economy overall. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. And um, the next question is, with interest rates low, energy prices low, inflation low, the value of the U.S. dollar weakening, and Biden administration planning a $1.9 trillion stimulus package, is this a recipe for growth or value to outperform in 2021? And Josh, do you want to take this one? Josh? Yeah, sure. I think in the short term, it's probably going to favor cyclical stocks. Um, you know, Jeff just went through all the the as, as to the question kind of addressed. There's a lot of positives for equities. Um, you, know, you talk about potential for up to 13% of GDP to be delivered as stimulus. It's really the icing on the cake. We're talking about a healthy consumer reduction in social distancing measures. Um, you know, I, 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 not to make fun of my mother and my lover, but she's getting her first vaccine shot next week, and I'm having to talk her out of booking a flight. You know, the day after uh, leaving aside how anyone listening might feel about their own mother-in-law. The reason I mentioned it is that there's a lot of pent-up demand out there, and I think that as that gets released, given the consumer health Jeff talked about, that makes me pretty optimistic about the continuation of the cyclical rotation. Uh, you think about things like airlines, uh, hotels, and some cruise lines, some of the more travel-sensitive things where no one has been able to, to, to get on a cruise ship for quite some time now. Uh, there's a lot of pent-up demand for those types of activities. I think that that should push cyclicals uh, to kind of continue the, the leadership that they really saw from uh, 
October, November, December, kind of took a little bit of a pause uh, in the first part of January, but, but another leg for that cyclical trade as we move through the balance of, of 2021, just given that eventual release of that, of that pent up demand. And it's not just the consumer side too, there's, there's also a fair amount of business activity uh, that has a somewhat different, but, but generally similar uh, dynamic at play. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think it's uh, you know, cyclicals versus defenses versus instead of growth versus value. Um, but, uh, you know, with GDP growth coming in at, you know, close to 8% this year, um, we've done some analysis that when GDP growth moves above 5%, um, it's usually very uh, strong tailwind for value and cyclical outperformance. But uh, I think it's important to note that consumer discretionary and IT are very cyclical sectors, and they should do well in this type of environment. Great. Thanks so much. And the next question is, with, tre with um, treasuries unstable, Bitcoin being irrational, real estate recession sensitive, and gold maxed, where should an investor think about going to diversify for safety? I'll take that one. I, I, think, I think it depends on, on your time horizon a little bit, but if you have, say, three or five years, I actually think equities aren't a bad place to be. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of worries about the stock market, about valuations, about you know, health of corporate America. But if you look, a lot of companies, particularly large cap equities, uh, but really uh, across the cap spectrum, a lot of these companies have weathered coronavirus and the impacts it's had, which were truly remarkable. Uh, they've weathered that storm remarkably well. They've been able to survive and in many cases thrive. Uh, if you look outside the U.S., um, you know, some non-U.S. stocks, you know, potential for a weaker dollar. One of the things we're talking about, I think the last question could make, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, – uh, a little bit more interesting than it's been maybe over the last decade or so where you've had a pretty strong dollar uh, regime and that tends to make U.S. stocks look better, rel uh, relatively more favorable to non-U.S. A lot of the clients we talk to are, are underweight non-U.S., so that might be a, a, an angle on the diversification trade. Uh, some of the things that our colleagues in Australia specialize in the listed infrastructure space could be kind of interesting, but, uh, you know, I think it, for me, for the incremental dollar, if you have a couple of years, I think equities are probably not a bad place to be. And, and as Jeff was talking about, if we get, uh, you know, any, any sort of choppiness or a bit of a pullback, uh, probably not a bad entry point for, for longer term. Yeah, and I, I would just also Maybe. just add to that credit sensitive fixed income would probably be a, a good place as well versus treasuries. I, I do think treasuries are going to rise over the course of this year, but credit sensitive fixed income is more sensitive to changes in the economy. So that should, you know, kind of be the other stool of the chair, if you will, uh, for, for diversification purposes. Great. And another question we've gotten is um, earnings look good, but um, they have um, drastically cut staff and costs at a number of different companies. So um, are the near-term earnings expectations really quality comps to past returns? I think they are. I mean, you know, you have operational leverage coming out of any recessionary environment, right? You cut costs to the bone, you know, revenues pick up dramatically, and, um, you know, you, you get the benefits of operational leverage at each dollar of revenue is going to have a disproportional effect on your, your earning stream. And uh, companies were very nimble this time around in cutting costs. But more importantly, I think the economy is wearing back much quicker than what you've traditionally seen coming off of a recessionary trough. So, I think you're going to get the tailwind in, in two aspects. You know, costs are, are low, but also the economy is going to rebound quicker, which is going to uh, provide better top-line revenue growth, which really should be an earnings environment that's going to be better than what you've traditionally seen uh, coming off of other recessionary lows. And that doesn't even take into consideration the, the dry powder um, that we've talked about on the consumer balance sheets, on corporate balance sheets. Uh, that's likely going to make its way into the economy where you just generally don't have that strength of the consumer or all that other dry powder um, when you get into year two of a, an economic expansion. So it, I think it is a different environment, but I, I think it's different in a good way where earnings could drastically surprise to the upside. If I can just add, I think the market's pretty discerning too. You know, in some cases where the, you know, the, the comps are a little bit weird and you get a one-time pop in earnings, but it's really unlikely to continue when we look out and talk about 2022, 2023, 2024. Uh, it's really a pandemic type of thing that's going to renormalize. Uh, that's not being valued uh, you know, fully, as opposed to companies that are having earnings that, you know, oh, this is actually something that we think is, is sticky. So, you know, there's a big debate within the retail space of you know, how sticky is the shift to online shopping. This is a, you know, one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about talking about. Um, and so the market, you know, isn't just valuing each dollar of earnings equally. It's, it's being a little bit discerning about you know, how, how, what the longevity to them might be. 
Great. And um, another question we have is, how does ClearBridge use the AOR research in their own portfolios, um, by way of example, in, in a portfolio such as large cap growth SMA? Yeah, so we don't have a house view. Um, it means that our PMs don't happen to listen to us or take our work and plug it into theirs, but we are a resource available to the PM teams. And it's not just the content you hear, but also all the research behind it and really a whole lot more. Uh, it varies with each PM team, candidly. You know, it's a firm we have PMs that manage a wide array, or wide array of strategies, excuse me, and they have their own different personal styles and how, how they go about doing their jobs. There's some PMs that if we don't talk to once or twice a day, it's a bit odd. You know, you, the, the question you mentioned, large cap growth, I sit right outside of Margaret's office normally, and you know, we, we talk all the time. Uh, when, we're, when we're in the office normally. There's others, PMs, that if I talk to, if I've talked to more than once or twice a month, it, it kind of feels a little bit weird. It's like, wow, we've really been talking to that person a lot lately. Um, you know, I think similarly, there's some PMs that kind of take what we say and just roll with it, and there's others that, you know, we probably disagree more than we agree, and that's great. It helps challenge our views, helps challenge their views uh, and then assumptions, and it can be useful to both sides. Uh, Jeff and I actually host a quarterly lunch. A vast majority of what we've talked about on the call today overlaps with what we said on that, that lunch. We actually took our slide deck from that lunch, and that was the starting point, point for today's call. Um, you know, we provide a lot of different updates, and PMs can come to us with questions, too. So we try to flag information we think that's important for them. They will come to us with questions or ideas they have and, and, and let us go dig on them and circle back with them. You know, PM's expertise ultimately is, is on picking stocks, and we just try to help them think about bigger picture issues, help keep them appraised of what matters, and, and almost equally important sometimes, what doesn't matter? What should they be looking past? And that lets them focus on what they do best, which is picking good stocks. You know, a recent example might be thinking about where the recovery looks better or worse, try and help them think about what industries might be opportunities if the spread of COVID-19 you know, worsens or gets better. I mentioned a uh, second ago the uh, you know, how, what trends might look like for online versus brick-and-mortar retail, how much of that is going to be sticky or not. But at the end of the day, you know, all of our PMs are making fundamental bottom-up decisions, and we think macro is an important piece of the puzzle. Studies show it's a meaningful chunk of stock returns driven by macro factors. So we're just trying to help them understand and be aware of everything that's going on so they can make the best decision possible considering all the different angles. And we want to be a part of the mosaic, if you will, uh, in terms of what that looks like. Sometimes it's more background research, as I was kind of alluding to, help narrow the funnel for security selection. Other times it's really more around portfolio construction conversations. But it really does vary across the different PMs, just you know, given the wide array of, of strategies and, and personal styles those PMs have. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, do you do you expect um, regulations to come from what we've seen from individual traders? Specifically, I think this is um, regarding uh, what we've seen with GameStop, individual traders at manipulation on Reddit. Something going on with GameStop? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's all anybody can talk about nowadays. It's just, it, the rise has been meteoric and surprised quite frankly me uh, that it's gone on as long as it has but I, I don't see more regulations coming from uh, obviously the short squeeze that's happened right it's a, a part of the business but what I do think may happen is you're going to see much more of a premium uh, embedded into call options going forward not dissimilar to what you saw in the crash of 1987 up until the crash of 1987 no one thought that the market could lose 22 percent in one trading day after that point uh, put options got permanently more expensive because the realm of possibilities was was open that that you know standard deviation event of you know 22 actually happened and I think the similar situation is going to happen this time around where you can have a short squeeze uh, to the magnitude that we saw with GameStop and a lot AMC and a lot of these other uh, most shorted companies uh, and that's going to just manifest itself into a more expensive call options that you're going to have to pay going forward because the the realm of possibilities has gotten bigger but ultimately from a regulation standpoint i, I don't necessarily see you know anything coming down the pike on, on that way but I, I do think you are going to see a change in in options pricing i agree and if anything i think you get enforcement of existing regulations more so than the new regulation Thanks, guys. And I guess in kind of in the same vein, someone's asked about how you view yesterday's market drop. Well, it, it's tough, right? One, I mean, it's hard to discern any one day and, and what's the driver of that day. One could make the argument that uh, you, because of the short squeezes that were going on, uh, a lot of players that were short those positions were forced to liquidate other positions, and that was a, a driver of the, the move down in the equity markets. One could make the argument that equity markets were moving down because of the slowing economic environment that's happening here. You're, you're seeing it across a lot of different data points, but also 
you know, you haven't seen much progress on Joe Biden's stimulus package as well. So there's some fear that you're not going to see that come to fruition. Also, the dollar was strengthening yesterday. Um, usually the market trades in inverse to dollar strength. And, you know, the dollar has been strengthening really over the last five or six days, which happens to coincide with the last five or six days being negative. Um, so I think there's probably a number of different drivers there. And, and quite frankly, it could be a sell the news type of situation where, you know, you have such a large amount of gain uh, from the beginning part of March and the market really hasn't taken a breather here in a while um, where people are just taking some of those gains off the table. So, it's hard to really point to one specific catalyst yesterday, um, but I think it's probably a combination of, of some of the things that I mentioned there that uh, that, that ultimately proved to, to see the, the first meaningful market saw that we've experienced in a couple months. Um, and quite frankly, positioning stretched optimism is very rampant right now. Um, again, part, quarter of our view is that we've been expecting some sort of consolidation or pullback. It's just the catalyst is very difficult to, to be able to ascertain and and be able to predict. I don't know, Josh, if you have any other views on it. No, I'd, I'd just add that uh, a lot of the sort of basket of, you know, most 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 shorted stocks were obviously underperforming pretty dramatically or outperforming uh, dramatically yesterday. Kind of the hedge fund, you know, VIP list or the most common hedge fund trades were underperforming. So I think there was definitely a little bit of a, um, market participants trying to put the screws, turn the screws on a, on a Kind of distressed player or perception of weakness, but that's kind of unwinding today. Um, those you know most shorted baskets are, are uh, you know underperforming pretty meaningfully. Great. Well, th thanks so much, guys. I think unfortunately we're um, coming to the end of our time. I just want to thank both of you for all of your insights. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground on the call today. I'd also like to thank all of the participants um, on the call for calling in and taking part in our Q&A. I think I just want to mention, I know there are a few Q&As that are outstanding, and we will be getting back to everyone on those questions that we were unable to answer or get to on this call. Um, I wanted to lastly just mention that a replay for this call will be emailed to all participants and available on our website in the next 48 hours. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.